Okay, so Zoom has informed me that we are now recording. So I want to welcome everyone to another Crypto Wednesdays. Here we are on episode 32, broadcasting live from all around the world. We'll go around and see where everyone is, but I, I'm at least in Dubai. Uh, this is Gordon Einstein. I'm your enthusiastic host. And today we have a very interesting topic. We're going to be talking about Bitcoin, sustainability, energy, the, the circular economy, and all the implications of this good stuff. I want to introduce my lovely co-hostess, uh, Anastasia. Welcome. Glad to have you as always. Hello, yes, thank you, Gordon. It's, it's great that you're doing this. We're doing this together. Um, okay, so as usual, before we dive in, into the topic, or maybe as a prequel to the topic, we're going to go around, introduce our panelists, the special crew, and we're going to get, of course, who they are and what they're working on right now but a little bit of background because it's always good to know the road that people have taken to reach where they are now because that adds a lot of context. And I always like to know how people, to the extent they know each other, have met. So we're just going to explore. Um, I'm going to make sure I say this. I'm going to try to make sure I say this correctly. Jahid, am I saying this correctly? There's two ways to go. Jahid. Okay, Jahed. I'll make a permanent note that accent is on a second syllable. Jahid, please start off since you were sort of the impetus for this. Very nice to see you. Very nice to talk to you again. Tell us about yourself. And by the way, just you know, everyone, this man is a little bit sick, but he made it. So that he's like a Marine. I love it. All right, go for it. No, I'm sorry. Don't compare me to the Marines. Um, okay. But, You're a space um, Marine. A space Marine. <laughs> Fair. Um, but uh, no, no branch of the military. I'll get into that later. Um, but anyway, um, about me, I uh, basically got to the space um years ago not not too much not, i wouldn't call myself an og around 2016 i was very much interested in self-managing organizations uh sort of the future of human uh, future of human organizations how people make decisions all that and there was a lot of really weird stuff happening around that time with you know ethereum and the dow and what have you got involved with aragon and gnosis back then and kind of saw the promise of this stuff but it was still super early days um i ended up founding my own company not a crypto company more focused on machine learning and um applying that to uh, infrastructure so data infrastructure and container infrastructure super boring project but along the way um honestly it was a great learning experience i worked in product and marketing and really focused on getting people users getting our company users right as one of the founders and that, honestly, at the end of the day, when people talk about innovation and tech, yeah, that stuff is important. But if you don't have a, something that tells people what you do and gets them through the door, none of it is really you know worth anything, right? Like distribution is super important. So that's kind of where I cut my teeth on that stuff. And along the way, though, I've been always keeping an eye on what's happening in crypto. And uh, I was lucky enough to meet the Regen Network team, which is a one of the layer one blockchains of the Cosmos uh, network, uh, Cosmos ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing with nature-based assets and climate mitigation and, you know, kind of the uh, sort of network of stakeholders they're bringing together in their protocol caught my attention. And this is kind of, you know, I was looking at stuff like Gnosis early and Aragon and self-managing organizations and then seeing the tech that was being built to really issue new ecological assets on chain. And that caught my attention. So I actually, you know, met a partner who had invested early in those folks and decided that there's a lot of work to be done at the intersection of open source software and climate. Mm -hmm. So um, that was kind of the the thesis behind the fund, right? Is that if you need, um, honestly, one of the best ways to conserve nature is to privatize it or to open it up its ownership to more people privately. Like if you look at the scientific mm. literature, it's been proven like almost time and time again that public projects are good, private projects are good, commonly held projects are good. But if you don't have anything there, then you lead, you're kind of led into this global commons problem that we face ourselves, that we find ourselves facing today, right? So um, uh, sorry, let, let me interrupt. when you say open source and nature and natural resources, open source software or open source sort of governance? Uh, both <laughs> actually okay. like, All right, we'll, we'll, I'm happy we'll dive to get into that. that too yeah yeah but I think like basically openly governed and openly owned tools that are not kind of walled up behind anyone's control are mm -hmm. largely a big part of the solution here and um and yeah that's kind of how I got into this space and then you know I met these two fine fellas over the course of the last year or so who are both uh, building in the space of Bitcoin and sustainable uh, energy and you know, kind of that's just this much of the story. I'll kind of not going to steal from their intros, but um, but yeah, that's how I got into the space, what I'm interested in and basically really interested in scaling nature markets 
And that includes energy, that includes carbon credits, that includes credits and types, typologies that don't exist yet, uh, just so that we have an economy that at the end of the day internalizes everything that it relies on as an input and understands its, its impact so that we don't just have the, you know, up and to the left uh, economy growing good understanding of what's happening on our planet. Interesting. And I noticed that when we were discussing the theme for this talk, it, it wasn't blockchain, circular economy, energy, all that other stuff. It was Bitcoin. Is there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe steal the lead a little bit. Is, is there a reason for that? No, be, well, I mean, we just scoped it, man. We, how much time you got? You want to be here for five hours? <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we, it, it, it has happened. It has happened. But no, we, I, 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 I think it's more interesting to stuff. scope it to block it to. Uh, I hope it's more interesting. I think it's more interesting to really tightly scope a topic around Bitcoin. But our thesis is not our fund is not Bitcoin specific. So fair enough. Okay, I want get. I'll bring the other. We'll bring the other participants into the conversation. Then we'll kind of. Play ball with it. So Bradford, but I'm going around in my screen. There's not any particular order. So Bradford, welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Gordon. Um, to uh, to answer your earlier question, calling in from Istanbul, um, and to give you a little bit of my my background. My background, my professional background, has actually always been in um, environmental sustainability. Uh, almost my entire career, actually. I uh, I started my career. I'm actually working at a factory in southern China uh, in a city called Dongguan, which was one of the um, factory sort of cities of the world. Um, I mean, it's literally like, you know, factory upon factory upon factory, uh, like New York City is office building on office building on office building. Um, yeah. And um, and this was right after school and um, right after college. And, um, you know, I, I would walk every day from the factory back to my apartment and cross over this this little canal that had been built. And I would stop like almost every day to, to look into this canal because it, it it just blew my mind that it looked almost like it was like crude oil mm -hmm. rather than water. And it was like almost like bubbling and thick. And that really sort of caught my interest. And I was like, we are absolutely destroying this planet. Um, and so that's where I decided I needed to get into sustainability specifically, um, mm -hmm. you know, not just sort of supply chain. Um, and I ended up taking a job with a, um, a Fortune 500 that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange called VF Corporation, which mm -hmm. is um, the owner of the North Face, Vans, Supreme, Timberland, a number of well-known brands. Um, and I actually built their environmental sustainability department uh, for the better part of a decade, um, primarily focused on the their um, highly fragmented global supply chain, um, but, but looking at sort of all facets of environmental sustainability from raw material procurement um, to um, sort of energy efficiency with our, you know, our partners. Um, and so my entire career has been you know, effectively looking at how do you address you know, environmental challenges for complex organizations. Um, that was my uh, my MBA and my environmental studies all rolled up into one, those eight and a half years. Um, it was a, a really fascinating experience for me. Um, mm -hmm. I got to work on things like um, resource efficiency projects that um, the World Bank IFC picked up the work that I had sort of designed and, and scaled it to a number of brands and countries uh, throughout the world and notably in Southeast Asia. Um, worked on um, a... a uh, Energy, a renewable energy feasibility study that led to one of the largest solar rooftop projects uh, in Asia, located in southern Vietnam, um, about 50 megawatts on top of a massive, massive factory. Um, so, so really interesting work. Um, I've also at the same time had like an itch to be entrepreneurial and um, always have like my entire life, I feel like. Um, and so I dabbled in various entrepreneurial things. We don't need to talk about you know that right, right away. Uh, happy to at some point, maybe in this 90 minutes that we have. Um, but then uh, I, in sort of 2018, I started to dive into digital assets, mm -hmm. predominantly as a big skeptic, actually. Uh, I was hugely skeptical uh, of digital assets. Um, you know, for me, it was like magic internet money backed by nothing. How does this work? Mm -hmm. until, until I learned about the happening, uh, and it was actually a, um, a, uh, a, a crypto trader in Taipei, I was, I was sitting, a friend of a friend, we were having breakfast together and he told me about the happening. And that's mm -hmm. when I really started to get fascinated by it. A and then I learned about the energy component. 
And that's where all of this sort of came to a head. And I was like, ah, this is backed by energy. That makes a lot of sense. You know, this is universal. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this can, you could, you could use this thing anywhere in the world. Anyone can participate as long as they have energy. So, um, you know, I'm now building sustainable Bitcoin protocol. We've been building it now for uh, two years, almost to the day. Um, sustainable Bitcoin protocol is a, is a market-based mechanism designed to financially reward Bitcoin miners who use transparent, clean energy sources um, and, and in turn allow institutional investors a way to um, add verifiable sustainability claims to their Bitcoin holdings without disrupting the fungibility of Bitcoin. And so I know I've already, I've already, uh, it's been a long introduction, so I'll, I'll, I'll cut myself off. I, I actually know you, um, you, you, you triggered to, I was, I was listening to you with, with interest. You, you, you're the first person I've heard say, we've had lots of people and I've had lots of conversations with people who are skeptics of digital assets. I, and they've come around Maybe myself included, though I was, I was never too skeptical. But you know, you hear extreme cases, and then they usually the thing is they read the white paper and go, "Oh my gosh," you know, and then they have they have that epiphany and they you know switch their career, divorce their husband, and you know join <laughs> join the revolution. Um, but you're the first one who's actually pointing out the happening as the trigger moment. That's kind of interesting. I, I, I want to catch up on that. And then when you were talking about the sustainable Bitcoin protocol, if I understand it correctly, you know, I remember getting all excited when Elon Musk. I like I'm a fanboy. You know, when when he was investing in Bitcoin, and then he, you know, we retroactively found out he got out of Bitcoin. And part of the reason that it was alleged that he got out, and he I think he tweeted something kind of getting this direction is the environmental consequences of proof of work mining. And then you're mm. maybe providing you I want to hear about the project, but you're maybe providing a legitimate. ESG or other basis for companies that would want to invest in this to invest in it and handle the energy or, or pollution argument. I think that's what I'm hearing. So that's yeah, that's precise, pretty fascinating. precisely. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, I think you know, there's actually some some additional layers that we can un, unpeel to it, but um, you know, we'll, 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 it, we'll, not, we'll get to Andreas and, yeah. and then actually I'll pop right back to you. Let, let's do that. So let, me, let me just bring him in the conversation. Andreas, the man with the best LinkedIn photo ever. Good to have you. Oh my god! <laughs> Thanks for having me, Gordon. Uh, yeah, to to jump back to your original question, original, you look uh, you, you look like a version of PewDiePie. How many billion <laughs> followers do you have? Okay, no, go ahead. Maybe I should start a YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, secondary yeah. secondary career opportunity. Um, no pleasure to be here. This is going to be interesting. Um, so I'm also calling out from Barcelona, like Chahid, uh from Spain. Mm -hmm. So beautiful weather here. And I've been, um, to go back to my background a little bit, I've been in sustainability probably, I mean, over 15 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the sustainability angle started like watching Al Gore's first documentary when I was still quite young and kind of realizing, okay, there's shit going on. And nobody's talking about it, at least not in my, I'm originally from Austria, from in my small hometown of 10,000 people. Climate change wasn't really a thing that was very much discussed. And I've wanted to work on that problem in one way or another. So I'm an engineer by background. So I st studied sustainable engineering in Sweden mm -hmm. for like 10 years, worked with one of Europe's biggest renewable energy utility in Norway uh, on them moving into solar. And then after my studies really doubled down on what can I do and what is actually additional. So I became an entrepreneur, uh, not because I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but that was like the way that I saw I could make the biggest dent mm -hmm. uh, and started my first startup, which, uh, is an impact investment platform that focuses on solar in emerging markets. So we, we basically raised a bit over 80 million euros from private investors into solar energy projects, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, did that for eight years, seven, eight years as co-founder and COO. Traveled a lot in Africa, it was very interesting. So a lot of different uh, ways of living, which gives you a nice perspective on life. Um, and it was a fun journey, I would say. It's definitely realized, similar to Bradford, that I have an entrepreneurial tick, and that really, mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed that um, exploration and problem solving and more solution oriented. And then I guess about three, four years ago, I, so I'm definitely not, not OG. I came across Bitcoin. I started dabbling a little bit in it. I put some money in um, and also started looking at other crypto things. 
Mm -hmm. uh, when I left my first startup, I had this great idea to take out a bit of money from the bank and put it in all of these crazy crypto projects and trying to make a passive income. That was at the top of the market. Uh, let's not talk about how it's going. <laughs> was definitely not a good experiment. Well, uh, I, 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 honestly, I, I think if you just stopped at the first part, which is taking your money out of the banks, you would have been fine. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. Okay. But go on. Putting okay. it in Bitcoin. Uh, no, Something. and then I realized there's maybe, I mean, for me, I think there is a difference between crypto and Bitcoin a little bit, um, mostly. Maybe I'm a bit burned. So I looked at Bitcoin more and I read a paper by ARK Invest I think a year or two years ago, where they talked about the combination or the interaction between energy and Bitcoin, which I found really fascinating because it kind of combined my two interests I had at that time. Energy was my background. I mm -hmm. spent over a decade in energy and Bitcoin was kind of the new thing that I was started, starting to look at. And suddenly there was an intersection and I was looking at proof of work and, and that being kind of not seen as very positive um, a lot externally. I found that's interesting. I, I don't like when people get polarized too much about a subject. So I really wanted to dig in what's what's happening here. And with that focus or that fascination, a bit over a year ago, started looking at the second startup journey, which was then focusing on what, what can be done on, the, on this intersection. Originally, we looked at Africa and looked at how can Bitcoin be a customer to mini grids in Africa, because I did a lot of mini grid financing. And we thought that this could be a kind of industrial client, so to speak. Um, we realized with solar, it doesn't make a lot of sense, at least not at this current stage. There's a company that does this in Kenya, actually, uh, with hydro and with hydro, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, just to bring in, you, you decided that solar wouldn't make sense in a Bitcoin mining context or in a, or in a different context? I didn't quite catch that. In the context that we had, which was Bitcoin mining, because with solar mini grids, you don't have power for half of the day. So you can only run your infrastructure half of the day, which means getting back your CAPEX uh, is really hard. And the battery prices are just insanely high. So it doesn't make sense to run a battery mini grid out there. Uh, with hydro, you have the opposite. Mm -hmm. With hydro, you have a higher capacity factor. It's like over 90%. So meaning that your miners run a lot longer. We're going a lot into detail now. I don't want to spend too we can We can definitely discuss this. But basically, if you run your infrastructure for only half of the time, you're never going to get your investment back. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so great. Good good interest to all of you. Now, I, be, be, before we go, well, I'm going to wrap just, up. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Gordon. Go I just wanted to finish the journey because that was our first iteration. And now we're looking at methane and landfills. So methane, uh, there's companies that do this in the US already. Um, and we are looking at this in Europe and looking at emissions of methane that are not treated today that are going into the atmosphere. Methane is the biggest, one of the most potent greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. And instead of letting them into the atmosphere, using them for Bitcoin mining. We can talk about that. In more nice. Uh, I, I saw a weird video a few years ago. I think it's a lady scientist drilled a hole, I think, into Arctic ice. And then the air that escaped, she held a lighter to it and it caught fire. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I guess we have a lot of, and someone made the comment that it, methane is far more of a greenhouse gas than, say, carbon dioxide. Is that true? Like it's a, it's 100x or something? 35 okay, so the, to 80, depending on who you ask. Depending on who you ask. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Now, one of my favorite expressions, if someone's watched the show before, is explain it to me like I'm five. So before we get into the the nuance of Bitcoin and sustainability and all that, I remember when I was growing up, we were talking about conservation or environmentalism. And then the term sustainability started to raise its head. Do you, is this... Just another word for the same thing, or what, what are we implying when we say sustainability? Is there any particular agenda or angle on that? No, I think it's the same thing. I mean, it's just another way to say environmental sustainability is, uh, you know, is, is the same as what you're saying, effectively. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. fine. I'm, go ahead. Well, Maybe I think, I'll go ahead, Andreas. You first. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I think for me, sustainability means living in a way that we can sustain the lifestyle we have or better lifestyle for future generations without it making it more detrimental. It's like if you have a bucket of water and you're draining the water faster than it runs in, you're going to be empty at some point. Right? Okay, so it's not inherently conserving, it's maybe maintaining so things can go out of the system so long as you have equal inputs into the system? Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> Please, right. 
I, I was so this has been deep in my brain for the last couple of weeks or so as we're doing another version of our deck and basically mm. you know sustainability um we're looking at it from a numbers perspective too so mm. if you look at the goods and services that come from nature which includes mm. energy well actually sorry this particular state doesn't include energy we're talking only about like agriculture commodities timber stuff like that it's about mm. 9.8 trillion dollars extracted from nature that you know goes into the the global gdp that you know mm -hmm. that's all the you know commodities cocoa food all that kind of stuff and if you look at just agriculture the cost the environmental impact mm -hmm. of agriculture on global systems the nature is about 12 trillion dollars in terms of damages right and so like mm -hmm. this is stuff to like topsoil um uh, biodiversity destruction which then prevents the you know regrowth maintenance rewilding all that kind of stuff so if you look at just the food uh, the global food and ag sector, it mm -hmm. produces less in its output than the costs that it actually exacts on the, on a dollar basis every year. Right. And so mm -hmm. if you want to get really specific about what sustainable means, it's actually trying to build a market that prices the environmental impacts with respect to what it takes to actually deliver the products and finds a way for you to actually make those things either balance out or creates market incentives that say this much damage is actually not good for take some future time period, right? Maybe you can build mm -hmm. derivatives, risk models, other things that help you manage that future risk instead of just pretending that you can grow infinite food forever and waste 40% of it trying to get it to its destination. Interesting. It, you're... Sustainability is super specific, can be super specific like, like that. So you're talking about internalizing the externalities, which are exactly. sometimes even not being imposed on people. Sometimes it's just yeah, externalities being imposed on the commons. Exactly. It's just like it's not my problem. We'll just throw this over the throw this over the wall. It'll be someone else's problem. It'll be the future generation's problem. It'll be another economy's problem. It'll be the people downstream of us problem, right? Whatever. Interesting. All right, let me come back to Bradford. Bradford. Just because it caught my ear, why did the why did the happening strike lightning for you? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was just fascinating to see like economic policy effectively hard-coded into a store of value or monetary system. Um, I think, you know, at that time, I I better understood, understood the, you know, capped supply of Bitcoin and that, um, you know, the vast majority of it had been mined already. Um, however, the the mining of it and the, the, you know, the block subsidy was going to continue until, you know, the year 2140 or so, but just diminishing every four years. Uh, it was just fascinating to me. I, I thought it was it was unique. Um, and that was just, you know, it's just something that caught my attention, um, got me to start to dig a bit deeper. Um, you know, and, and then, as I said before, the, the energy component was the next thing that really pulled me in. You're sick. I, I, my, one of my points that it grabbed me was the adjustment of the difficulty of the, of the mining algorithm based on how quickly the blocks were being produced over that box, because the, because the, how do you how do you know it prevents people from gaming the system to a certain effect by you know overloading the system with mining or hash power? Well, the system knows it's doing that, and it's a decentralized system that knows it's doing that, and it doesn't exist. I mean, it doesn't have access to an atomic clock, so how does it know how quickly blocks are getting mined? But it somehow it figures it out. It's it's kind of crazy. So yeah, it's it's fascinating. So the the energy component of it is interesting also because I've heard. People describe Bitcoin as energy-backed money, but it's kind of energy-consumed money from my naive perspective. Are you attracted or repelled by the way you use energy? Or kind of nuance that out for me. Yeah, I was, I was, I was actually attracted by it. I think you know, it, I would say it's energy-backed money. Um, you know, in the sense that um, you know, it, it, it is energy that actually secures the network itself right it's mm -hmm. you know it's impossible it's it's impossible to um you know disrupt or hack the network in any sense without expending copious amounts of energy um and mm -hmm. so in that sense it, it it really is backed by energy um and i think you know the fascinating component about energy for me is that it's mm -hmm. it's i mean it's completely universal there's no one who has you know a, a total monopoly on it um, you know, there's no government that can simply say, you know, I want to command this network. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, you, you they too would need to expend significant energy uh, to participate. Um, so it's it's for me, it's a very level playing field, something that, you know, virtually, and I know energy is not simple to produce, right? But um, we do produce it virtually on, on every, you know, everywhere in the world um, mm -hmm. with, with, with only a few exceptions. So um, I think, you know, that, that level playing field, I think is, is really fascinating. Um, you know, something that, you know, as, as Andreas is doing here, being able to use effectively like stranded, wasted energy sources and actually convert that uh, into a store of value or help, you know, help take those wasted stranded sources and contribute them to the security of a network, if you will, um, and get compensated for that. That opens up a lot of really interesting possibilities. Um, I think particularly from an environmental perspective, it mm -hmm. opens up many unique opportunities, um, which you know, I think the, the likes of those opportunities is it, we're, we're really just starting to scratch the surface here. Um, you know, the company that uh, Andreas was mentioning in the US, uh, or, or I think he was alluding to, um, in the U.S., you know, this is called Vespin, as, as I assume who is mentioning. Um, you know, really fascinating work. What they're doing with with waste gas in mm -hmm. garbage landfills across the U.S. Um, similarly, I think you know what what uh, Crusoe Energy is doing. Um, you know, really fascinating. It's it's effectively saying, hey, we've got this these stranded energy sources that are otherwise, um, you know, they're escaping into the atmosphere. Um, and having a, a massive impact on on global warming, um, mm. you know, let's contribute contribute those to good things. Um, and you know, that's the security of the network. And I think we're then finding that this is, you know, this is sort of the um, it's it, it is a uh, unique learning sort of place in that um, this network is always demanding the uh, cheapest energy sources that you know, that a miner can find. We want the, mm. you know, they want the, the least expensive energy possible. Uh, and so people are getting very creative. Um, and then we're finding that, you know, once we've learned that these energy sources can be used for this, this competition uh, to secure the network, well, if it can be doing that, well, why not, why can't it be doing, you know, sort of other types of, uh, of computation? Because effectively all this, you know, Bitcoin mining is, it's computation and energy. Um, and so we're seeing that, you know, What's been used for Bitcoin mining can now actually be used for other types of uh, sort of high intensity computation. Um, and so we're now starting to see some of these miners diversify um, elsewhere. So I think it's, it's you know, it's just, um, it's a system that allows for very unique innovation um, mm -hmm. in terms of, in terms of what it, it's, it's incentivizing. Okay. And are, are these captured? Go ahead, please. No, I was going to just add to that. Um... The uh, just to kind of put it in perspective too, when you talk about cheap energy, um, we in the U.S. coal is something like four cents per kilowatt hour, mm -hmm. and if you look at a place like Andorra, which is just north of us here, Andorra has a really really cheap energy for hydro, and it also mm -hmm. has these amazingly really cheap locked in prices where it can rent energy from Spain and France. I don't really know how they pulled this off, but they did, so they can get hydro from anywhere from five to 14 cents per kilowatt hour. And so when you look at that and talk about how Bradford's talking about, you know, we, we are looking for the miners are this great search function for the cheapest energy source because mm -hmm. they have to optimize their hash per, you know, their hash output per day. And so um, that just, it's just, it's kind of this magic thing where all the monkeys, us just said, this is valuable. And we have the search faction, the search function that just kind of finds that and locks onto it and has this great incentive system in place where we can now just say, great, now that we all value this, how can we get the cheapest possible energy from it? Right. And how can we also point it towards, you know, environmentally good outcomes? The other thing to point out about stranded energy, just to get super clear about it too, is that in the U.S., <clears throat> all my research has been in the U.S. on this, uh, which actually be interesting to get someone like Nicholas from New Layer Capital. Maybe he, if he sticks around, we can have him up on here in the Q&A session because New Layer sure. did Vespine and did um, a Block Green and a couple others. But um, if you look at the stranded energy ass the stranded energy assets in the U.S., it's something like mm -hmm. twelve to eighteen billion dollars a year is wasted. And when you look at how much how many energy assets have been put into place in the last few years. You look from Texas all the way up to the Midwest, it, you're looking at like wind 
uh, wind and uh, hydro and solar, that makes up that 12 to 18 billion dollars, right? And it's and if you've seen the duck curve, which is kind of this classic curve of California energy use during the day, it's mm. duck shaped because it kind of actually looks like a duck, and it's starting at the at the beginning of the day, peak energy use, middle mm. of the day, nothing end of the day peak energy use that middle of the day is kind of like you look at that and if you're you know one of these companies like andreas's company or you know Vespin or whatever that's just like that's just your signal right there like all that 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 drop in price per kilowatt hour usage is perfect for you right so you that's really the opportunity you're looking at in the space is that if you really want to build a circular economy on energy that offtake needs to happen right there right now it's just wasted right there's nowhere to put it and battery is too expensive to suck up all of it and grid mm. honestly the state of the grid in the united states isn't great either <laughs> so it's not like you actually need an incentive um structure in place to even drive the uh updating the grid for renewable and interruptible energy downstream of all these installations so again it's just kind of you know it points to mining in a many many different ways not just one interesting now l l let me ask you if let me give you a hypothetical. So Elon Musk joins this webinar, which of course he will any moment. And he goes, guys, I'm thinking about jumping back into Bitcoin, but I still have those environmental concerns. Is now the time to do it? Or what exactly do we need to do now so that I can go to my shareholders with a straight face and say, okay, now, now is the time. Andrea, so you're talking to Elon Musk. I mean, I think from the ESG concerns that a lot of people have, uh, Bradford is solving part of the problem while the Bitcoin network is still partially not sustainable, right? I think it's about 40-50% of the Bitcoin network that currently runs in renewables in whatever shape or form that is. Uh, so you can either go to sustainable Bitcoin protocol and get yourself a Bitcoin that is certified to be not running on coal. Mm -hmm. Or you invest in the transition that is happening and um, a person that should be known in this conversation is Daniel Batten, who writes a lot about Bitcoin and and methane in that case. And you can run the whole Bitcoin network on a few hundred megawatts of landfill gas projects, for example, which means it's not only carbon neutral, it's actually removing emissions from the atmosphere. And then it's actually a climate investment for all of a sudden to buy Bitcoin. And, to support no, uh, and I'm sorry, what, what is the cost of mining using that source as opposed to coal or subsidized and or electricity depends on a lot of details but the range i would say is somewhere between one two to five six cents a kilowatt hour depending on who buys so, what capex and uh yeah how you pay Bradford? yeah i think you know i think that uh most most of the miners who are buying sort of stranded um you know waste gas that on a on a per kilowatt basis, their mm. price is extremely low. Um, you know, almost free actually. But there's there's significant sort of uh, capex involved in you know getting organized to build mobile infrastructure that can be moved out into the oil and gas fields. Um, you know, this is pretty capital intensive. Um, you know, so if you were to blend those costs, I think probably. You know, you're still looking at at low cents per kilowatt hour. You know, like two cents, three cents, maybe maybe cheaper. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, but it, it's really that that sort of upfront capital cost. Um, but back to the point that was made, Joe had made. I I've heard figures that there's enough stranded and wasted natural gas in the world mm -hmm. uh, to power two two thirds of Europe's energy needs annually. Um, you know, so yeah. that is. And, and that is that is massive. And mm. you know, at the same time, at the same time, society's um, sort of computational needs are exponentially increasing. Um, you know, so we are using more and more data centers as each month passes. Um, so this is really, you know, a, a, a match made in heaven, if you will, it's sort of a perfect use case. Okay, but is the energy that we're using for Bitcoin mining drying up the market for otherwise useful compute? Or is well, it squeezing that market? I, th I, I think it is. Bitcoin itself is very useful compute. I mean, it. it Sorry, has, other it's, other useful Bitcoin compute. Uh, other, other than um, Bitcoin, uh, no. I, I you know I think again this is um, this is the lab, right? This is where we experiment and learn and figure out you know how to do these things, how to create mobile data centers. Um, you know, it's it's Bitcoin that is driving that innovation, actually, or Bitcoin mining, I should say, that's driving that innovation.
um, yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, look, I, 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 sorry, I, I buy that. I, I, I buy that the technology we're developing and the infrastructure we're developing because we want to mine Bitcoin has knockoff effects or knock-on effects of enabling other things. It's like the space race gave us tank, you know, or in microchips and, and all this other good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean, listen, I think that we're, we're just getting started here. Um, I mean, it's not like it's not like there's now a shortage of waste, you know, wasted and stranded gas. I mean, there's wasted and stranded gas virtually everywhere in the world that that mm -hmm. that the oil and gas sector operates. And, you know, we're really just scratching the surface, um, you know, of of this process um, to really utilize that gas. We're just getting started. I mean, there's really only a handful of, you know, moderately sized companies doing it. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're going to they're going to go from moderate sized companies to you know, well-known entities that are, um, you know, really looked at as the leaders in, in climate innovation and climate tech. Um, you know, as, as Andreas was saying that, you know, ultimately, I think when it comes to Bitcoin, we're going to be able to get mm -hmm. to a place where investors are going to look at Bitcoin and it's going to be considered one of the most sustainable and transparent asset classes, um, you know, writ large. It's, um, you know, where, where virtually like every single megawatt is accounted for, and many of those megawatts are actually um, reducing CO2 equivalents from entering the atmosphere, right? So they're, they are a CO2 E negative, if you will. Can you actually can earn? I, uh, can I Sorry. add a yeah, little bit ahead. onto that too, which is Please. now eating, I'm kind of eating into Bradford's like <laughs> swag here, swagger jacking here. Sorry, man. But I think uh, what's a really important unsolved problem globally, which I think Bitcoin is really well placed to, um, if not solve, but at least assist in, is the fact that if you look at it from the perspective of an institutional investor, like someone who's ESG minded, I'll say, you know, someone, let's say BlackRock fund manager, right? There's these guys have 10 trillion in assets under management. There's like probably hundreds of different funds rolled up into that company. There's probably someone there who's in charge of, you know, solar investments, solar ETFs, all that kind of stuff. What they still cannot do to this day is uh, globally, from even today in 2023, from new installations being put in, there's still a um, <clears throat> there's still a little bit of a discrepancy between the amount of energy produced by a solar installation and the claims of the energy that are that are produced from those installations. It's anywhere from like six to eight percent, basically. So like basically saying, hey, uh, we you know received X amount of energy from the sun, we turned this into electricity into the grid. There's still a little bit of like because of the AC and DC conversion and all those kinds of things. So there are people working on behind the grid innovations that literally just say this is the amount of electrons delivered to the grid, <laughs> right? That can actually say at the end of the day, this is what went into it, right? And so having a technology that actually says, uh, here's what we actually put into the grid, like a proof of it, if you will, is actually pretty mm -hmm. important. And it's not just, you know, it's not just Bradford and, the, and co working on this. There's a number of other people, Bitcoin or not, who are looking at this problem, but it's an important unsolved problem because basically we are underreporting the, uh, the amount of energy that comes out of some of these installations globally. And, uh, I really see Bitcoin as potentially being a driver of answering that because we already have this thing with proof of work that's like, you know, some amount of thermodynamic work went into compute to prove that something happened, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not the one who's going to sit here and solve that problem, but I think it's an important unsolved problem. You're, you're making me think so of this. It... Go ahead. I'm yes, so if I'm understanding correctly, what we're basically talking about, like what Bradford mentioned before, is it we're not only looking for sustainability of energy production, but also of energy consumption, ensuring that smaller part of energy is lost. But then if we look at like clean energy and not clean energy, in case of clean energy, is lesser amount of it lost because we can track it better? That's the that's the outstanding question, right? Someone needs to kind of build the, in, the innovation that lets us answer that question. Because today we are aware, you know, globally, when you actually run the test to look at what is the DC to AC conversion and all these sites, you will find anywhere from a six to eight percent discrepancy between energy captured on the on the photovoltaic photovoltaic cell and energy input mm -hmm. into the grid, right, for consumption. And so, something that approximates like a proof of green electrons, which you know. There's a few people working on this out there um, that I none of them none of whom are on this panel, but a few I can name maybe at the end too, who are actually trying to build uh, devices 
behind the grid that would actually be able to answer this question? IoT devices. So, like so uh, that, far, uh, there's no way to label energy. However, if we use energy for mining bitcoins, and we can like label those bitcoins as produced using clean energy, is it is it, that correct? It, exactly, and to some extent, that's kind of what Bradford's company is doing, right? It's actually tracing the root of energy to compute and saying that they have a history a verified verified history of one bitcoin being produced not the one that you hold but just one certificate that says one was made right so i know in the future they're also thinking of how do we do that on a you know actual per digital asset basis and trace it through the supply chain of digital assets but that's that's kind of an unsolved problem I, well, it was commonly when you were speaking before. I was thinking about Internet of Things, maybe this like Internet of Electricity, IOE. You know, if you, if you can if you can track if you have a, a bunch of smart devices that track it, but that that slippage is a little. The lawyer in me makes me wonder that slippage is just inefficiency, or there's something more going on. Well, I can send you a little something on this. I just got into it, man. But yeah, like uh, there's there's a number of issues. Interesting. Now the. Um, So when you're mining, you're, you're, I guess this is for Bradford, but then the rest of you chip in. So when you have the sustainable Bitcoin protocol and you have the green Bitcoin, I'm going to guess that that green Bitcoin is coming from a, a mine that blocks rewards. And those rewards are being described as green Bitcoin. But all these subsequent transactions relating to that Bitcoin aren't necessarily going through that miner. They're getting valid. All those subsequent transactions are being validated by proof of work by maybe non-green sources. So are you just talking about the initial block reward or is it, are there miners or validators that themselves are going to switch to green? And is there a way of tracking that? Yeah. So, um, you know, first off, just to sort of provide clarity on some nuance here. Um, mm -hmm. We are we are not saying that any specific Bitcoin uh, is green itself. We're actually sort of uh, bifurcating this and saying the mm -hmm. process by which a a, a Bitcoin uh, was mined was was done with clean or renewable energy sources, uh, and then taking that process and tokenizing it, saying you know in a, in a separate asset that says mm -hmm. or a separate sort of environmental instrument that says, you know, at, at the time that a Bitcoin was mined, uh, we now have an instrument that says that Bitcoin was or could have been mined uh, sustainably and that the required amount of energy to produce that particular Bitcoin for the entire mm -hmm. network um, is, is uh, you know, is verifiably sustainable. So, you know, let's say today it's around 420 megawatt hours uh, to mm -hmm. mine a single Bitcoin. That means that that particular instrument uh, will represent that you know 420 megawatt hours of clean energy um, you know is is being represented by this instrument, and so we then um, we then effectively allow for investors to buy Bitcoin from wherever they want. Um, maybe they already own that Bitcoin, um, and they can then purchase the you know the this clean Bitcoin mining attribution separately. Um, and what happens then is it becomes, you know, effectively a financial incentive for miners uh, who are going, you know, who are working with us. They now have an additional revenue source, which is that, you know, they've they've um, mined a Bitcoin with clean energy, uh, and that's now been monetized for them. They can actually sell the fact that their processes, um, you know, to mine are being done with with clean energy sources. Um, and so, that's getting back to your question. We, we actually intend to uh, address the uh, historical um, the, the historical emissions of the network um, mm -hmm. and over and overcompensate um, for those historical emissions in order to allow the um, the the instrument that we're creating to actually be climate positive um, meaning that you know it's it's the composition of our asset and this is starting to get a little bit complex to just describe uh, solely with, you know, describe it, you know, just um, without any visuals here, but um, the composition of the instrument is mm -hmm. effectively, um, it is from Bitcoin miners who use verified uh, renewable grid energy. 
Bitcoin miners who are mitigating CO2 equivalents um, through their mining practices like Andreas or Vespine or Crusoe. Um, and then finally, the purchase and retirement of clean energy attribution, um, i.e. the use of, of RECs in the United States or GEOs uh, in Europe or IRECs, for example. Um, all three of these different processes, they actually go into our instrument um, and make this instrument what's called a sustainable Bitcoin certificate. That's the name of, mm -hmm. of the asset. Um, make it a, a climate positive asset. So it actually accounts for um, you know, more than just what that particular Bitcoin, uh, what its impacts were. But from a, a, an awarding of the miners perspective, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are simply looking at, is this miner using verified clean energy or not today? Um, and so this is how we can incentivize them and, and help to start to um, address the future of the network. How do you sort of create that incentive to, to drive behavioral change so that the future of the network becomes increasingly transparent um, and increasingly run on clean and, and um, renewable energy sources. And then we fold into that a way to address the historicals, um, the historical emissions. And so all of this is done mm -hmm. in a fully in a fully fungible instrument. So when an investor buys the SBC or sustainable Bitcoin certificate, um, they actually you know, that that instrument is actually the composition of all the miners that are participating. You're not getting like a single, um, you're not getting just like, this is just from waste gas, or this is just from renewable grid energy. Um, you know, and, and what we would award Andreas's company is the exact same thing that we'd award a Bitcoin miner that is using grid energy in the States. Um, you know, and so, and so this is, this idea of fully fungible, it's, intended to fully address the current future and historical state of the network um, and ultimately allow for for this instrument to be climate positive i know that was a mouthful and i'm happy to try and unpack uh, a bit of it it was good it makes sense the do you think there's a future in tagging certain bitcoin specific bitcoin as mined as being green Sorry, do you want to just ask that again? So we're not, yes, yeah, so we're not you, tagging any Bitcoin. No, no, uh, like I, 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 no, I, I, yeah. I, I get it. My, my question is, is there, mm. I, I understand what you're doing and I, and I see the value in it. I'm asking, I guess, a related question, which is, is there mm. any, separately, is there any utility or potential utility in tagging or identifying Bitcoin as mined as originating from a green energy source? So I would, argue that that is a uh, futile exercise because actually um, every Bitcoin that exists dating all the way back to the Genesis block, they all inherently share the exact same carbon footprint, irrespective of where they were mined, when they were mined, what they were mined with, because each Bitcoin is fully fungible. And so, um, you know, if you had a Bitcoin that was mined on from mined by solar today, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you received it. And I have one that was mined from coal in China in 2015. Like we could theoretically exchange those and they have the exact same value and the exact same characteristics. Now, of course, with ordinals and, you know, there's that, this means there's sort of a, what I just said, maybe is not 100% exactly correct anymore with the advent of ordinals, but yeah, like this week, Oh, and I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to dive into the ordinals thing quite yet, although yeah. we, we, we can chat about it at some point. Um, you know, so theoretically, like every single Bitcoin, it shares the exact same carbon footprint. And so that's why we create an instrument that can address any Bitcoin from any point in time uh, mm. and addresses the entire network, you know, both historical and the, and also incentivizing the future. Um, and we think this yeah, is, is really the only... It, I'm sorry, and, and also I'm thinking it through. I mean, even if you were, even if you had a supposed a green Bitcoin, given the nature of how Bitcoin transactions are processed, you know, you groups that you know the way they flow in and out of wallets and how portions of power transactions get aggregated to to engage in a new transaction. Every every Bitcoin transaction is, is a mixer, essentially. Mm. So you would mm. you'd be blending your. It might be green for the first moment when you mine it but the very first transaction would mix it with other Bitcoin remnants. And then the resulting transaction, 
it wouldn't be green anymore yeah. anyways. You're right. It kind of makes, you're right. It makes more sense to think like a holistic approach. Well, an, another way to think about it is this, is that let's say that a, a particular block is won by a specific, uh, you know, miner um, who's using renewables right now. Mm -hmm. um, the fact of the matter is that actually there's still, you know, north of 50% of the network uh, or of miners participating in the network that are running on non-renewables right now, sure. um, they too are participating in the security of the network. I mean, every miner who's mining right now is participating in the security of the network. It's just that one of them happens to have won that specific block reward, right? But they're all participating yes. in the security. And therefore that particular Bitcoin and every Bitcoin, they actually all, they all have the exact same um, sort of, uh, environmental impacts, if you will, they share the exact same ones. And so while there are specific miners that, you know, are mining with clean energy or renewable energy sources, and they absolutely should be rewarded uh, and incentivized to be transparent uh, and use those clean energy sources, um, you know, we, we need to, whatever solution is created needs to consider, you know, the historics and all the miners that are participating. Um, and I, so we've. I, I, I agree with you. You're, you're right. It's not that one miner that secured the network. It was the arms race amongst all of them competing to mine that block. If there had been a single, right, it's a competition between them that produces the security, Pre not the individual action. Precisely. Precisely. Right. That's true. Um, That's true. Interesting. Wow. This is we're we're going into the weeds, but it's fascinating. Let me. Let me give you another thought that occurred to me as you were all speaking. And then any one of you can address it. The I've seen it again in the United States and elsewhere that people set up mining in a certain location, you know, whether it's their dorm room or, you know, you know, the friendly oligarchs nuclear reactor, maybe that doesn't happen in the U S so much. And when the local authorities, and maybe, maybe they have a relationship in the government, but when, when there's enough of a stink or the town loses power, they have, these miners have to go quickly to another location. And that, in my opinion, has led to an unfortunate concentration of mining power in the world because you, the place that we can politically get away with mining it seems to shrink and shrink and shrink which you know in a bad i think is bad for the network because we're kind of centralizing what should be highly decentralized we have centralization because of the capital requirements of mining but we also have centralization because there's only so many places on the planet that you can mine legally at an effective price um I, i'm wondering with your with your stranded energy term i, I like that term I, I wonder if that was fully embraced if we could sort of re-decentralize the network because the political resistance to mining would fade away because you're not tapping the main grid. You're now using energy that doesn't, you know, shut off the lights in the church. Yeah, I mean, you definitely remove the sting around Bitcoin mining that is seen often by the politicians, right? Which mm -hmm. is like competing with other uses of energy because that energy or that wasted stranded energy doesn't have any use case today. So you don't have competition. Um, and if you look at, for instance, renewables in particular, like solar, you're tapping into an energy source that is by nature decentralized. So you obviously it makes it easy to decentralize the Bitcoin network with such an energy source, keeping in mind that even Bitcoin mining has economies of scale. I mean, there's a reason that there's so many big Bitcoin miners in the world that have hundreds sure. of megawatts, even gigawatts of Bitcoin mining. It's not just because there's a political push in some countries, it's also if you install 10 megawatts of Bitcoin mining, it's going to be just so much easier from an economies of scale than doing 100 kilowatt, uh, I don't know, what is that, like a thousand times or whatever. Um, so so there's a balance somewhere here. We're not going to do one miner in each house. I think that's not going to run the Bitcoin network, uh, maybe as a heater, as some some of my friends have it at home. I see uh, that. But to, yeah. really run the, <laughs> yeah, to really run the Bitcoin network at the scale that it needs to be run, there will be a certain centralization which and hopefully will be counterbalanced with the decentralization you could have with renewables. And I'm, not, I'm not saying it would be completely decentralized as a result of making use of shredded energy, but I'm saying that the part of the decentralization, oh, like there's the economies of scale factor, which I don't think goes away, isn't affected by my argument. But there's areas where maybe you could have economic economies of scale, but you're precluded from operating there for political reasons because they don't want your energy con uh, consumption competing with the main or the other customers. But if you are going for stranded energy as opposed to oil-based or coal or, or nuclear, 
then maybe you could get rid of that political layer and the places that could have had economies of scale before suddenly become accessible because you're not hurting anyone. See what I'm saying or not? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it's definitely do. I mean, possible you remove the political layer because you are not as much ingrained in the environment or the ecosystem as you right. are currently if you run a miner on the grid. So then you have to run on the grid right here. You can actually have a PPA without any public involvement whatsoever. You can run on a private solar power plant somewhere on a, in the countryside or on, on somebody's private landfill and not necessarily have the problem of the politi politicians as long as there's no nationwide ban on Bitcoin mining, which depends on the country. But even if that happens, we've seen it before, it happened in China to some extent, and then Bitcoin mm. miners just move on and find other sources of energy like they did move to the US. And if the US says, no, we don't want this, they will find another country that says, hey, welcome. We have started, like, we want you to come here and bring some economic activity. I don't think Bitcoin will have the problem that there will only be one country left in the world that's going to do. Uh, no, I don't. I, I, I don't think so either. So let me let me ask another question because you guys alluded to it in the chat before we did the show, which is there's this concept of a circular economy. Um, like I mentioned a couple of times, can, can, can someone define that for me and, and explain how that relates to sustainability and to the Bitcoin mining and this whole process? Who wants to take that one? That looks wow. like Andreas and Bradford both wow. muted. So I, I think um, I'm I'm happy to take that one. So Go I for think it. like Please. Um, the um, <laughs> circular economy kind of depends on uh, again depends on who you ask. But one of the more popular definitions, I think, uh, what was her name? I think she wrote a book called uh, Donut Economics. But basically, it's just having a model of production and consumption that involves rationalizing the full sort of life cycle around what it takes to extract from nature, make a thing, use it, dispose of it, and also internalize any anything along that life cycle that produces um, you know, pollution or costs or imposes so social environmental costs that were either intended or unavoidable. And so uh, I think the UN has an SDG that's focused on this too. I don't remember which one it is, but um, basically that's, um, I think you can best understand it through an example right so in spain um actually i want to kick this over to andreas because i think i think andreas and what he's doing at big farms is a perfect example of a circular economy right so i don't want to steal your thunder man you go andreas uh, i mean a key element of circular economy is that you don't have waste in a way uh so you don't put stuff into yeah you don't have a waste product so in a normal economy you would have for instance somebody producing um, a product that has a waste product like leather, for instance, you have leather rests and then you upcycle that into a new product and make something circular out of it. Upcycling in itself is a circular process. In Bitcoin mining, for example, you use a waste product already. So instead of putting methane, for example, into the atmosphere, you take it and you use it in a way and you reuse it. So in this way, you make it a monetary asset and that can then be reused and be bought for other things. So there's a circular element somewhere here. Instead of having methane just going into the atmosphere and disappearing and being a waste product that everybody has to take care of. So that's a bit more Bitcoin specific, um, but circular economy as itself is just, you have industries that have waste products that might be an input for another industry that they can then use to produce their own product. And ideally you have as little waste as possible at the end of the day. Interesting, fascinating topic. Um, so, well, as, as and then a, also just to steal your thunder a bit, man. I think that you're you're you know, are you down to talk about the biogas mining sites? Because I think those are pretty cool, right? Like in Spain, you have uh, if you've been to Spain, right? The big popular um, culture cultural tradition is um, cured ham, so jamón ibérico, and these farms, there are more pigs than people in Spain, right? So. Um, these farms, there's a ton of uh, ecological destruction for this. And this is especially in the last 20 years, they have been scaled up massively. And so um, one of the output products from that is methane emissions from pig uh, droppings, right? And so mm -hmm. what do we do about those, Andreas? What do we do about those? Well, basically what you can do with those droppings is you can put them in an anaerobic digester. So currently they are open waste product, right? And nobody wants to take care of them because they are really hard to handle. Um, and what you do is you take them, you put them in an anaerobic digester of 
next to the farm, which normally is quite isolated as, as a thing. I mean, farms are not in the city, uh, otherwise we would have other problems. And by digesting them in an anaerobic digester, you create a product that can be used as a fertilizer. So you take that and put it back on the farm. And the methane then you use to produce electricity. And that's going back to what we discussed before. And you use that electricity, you can either uh, put it into the grid if you have a farm like that, but a lot of farms, like I said, are quite isolated. And then we talk about Bitcoin mining again. So you come up with an off taker that takes the electricity. In this case, we would put in a Bitcoin miner, a container with Bitcoin miner, and take that additional waste product. So you have fertilizer out of big waste, and then you have Bitcoins out of big waste. And the waste is more or less taken care of for it. Interesting. Yeah, so you've now like taken, you know, you're, you're turning, like you have your, your cured ham products going to the cured ham people. You know, you've got, there's land destruction, but at least you have, you know, the methane that's mitigated from, from this, you can capture and do something with. It's not a fully circular solution, but it's the start, right? Which I think is really interesting because then the methane is converted to carbon dioxide, whose impact relative to methane is like, like I said earlier, like 40 to 80 times uh, more on the methane mm -hmm. side, right? So if you convert methane to carbon dioxide, one of the most impactful things you could do for climate. So then it just sort of remains to be seen, like now that you've got that, you know, do you also do, you know, is there silo pasture? Is there nature-based solutions? Is there car, is, could you actually add direct air capture, you know, uh, as a technology next to the methane, um, the conversion of methane to carbon dioxide to then further reduce the CO2 emissions? There's a lot of options here, very capital intensive and research heavy still, but like you can potentially still have something that turns this to a fully mitigated cycle right and that's kind of the that's where the circular economy idea around using digital assets and bitcoin compute to do this originates let me let me ask you a general question is it the case because i think i'm hearing this theme is it the case that most of these facilities or tools are capital intensive to set up but the operating expenses tend to be very moderate compared to alternatives am i hearing that um, Generally, yeah. I mean, with solar, that's obviously the case. With solar, it's just taking light and takes makes it into electricity, and you have hardly any moving parts and, and not very a lot of maintenance. With landfill gas, you do have maintenance. You have a gas turbine, which needs needs some version of regular maintenance. But the the advantage that you have and that reduces your OPEX quite a bit is that your energy is nearly for free or for free, depending on how you set it up, because you're using a waste product that is actually to uh, Today, for for instance, a landfill in Europe, mm -hmm. often a cost point. Like they pay money to take care of their methane today because they have to to some extent. How they do that? Like how do they do that? Where they put in a flare and burn it, like in oil and gas. But because they're off the grid, they need often a diesel generator to run the flare, which costs them quite a bit of money. We're talking mm -hmm. about ten thousands of euros every year uh, for a small landfill, and you take care of that problem for them. So then obviously they don't necessarily expect you. I mean, obviously they would want to, but you can negotiate that away because you're taking care of a waste product and you get the, the, the methane for zero or one cent a kilowatt hour equivalent. That reduces your OPEX a lot compared to normal yeah. projects. Right? Interesting. All right, guys. So we're, we're going to just because I know you guys have to go after 90 minutes or so. We're going to open up to the second part of the show which is when we get the audience involved and they can ask questions. we got Marco and Anna Milke, and then I think you recognize some of the people. So let me look at our attendees. Um, Marco, I'm going to allow you to talk and go on video, but please put on a shirt. So Marco is famous for both attending, asking good questions, and me having to ask him to put on a shirt. So hold on here. Let's see if he's there. I'm here. Marco, are, are you decent? I am decent. Okay, fine. Because you know, uh, I'm in Spain. Make it is decent. <laughs> okay, now, now you're making me nervous. Are you decent or you're not? <laughs> okay. Why are you speaking in uh, in uh, 18th he's, century he, American? He's proof? such a lawyer. Such a lawyer. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm promoting <laughs> Marco to by language. Well, because you know it's a PG show. Okay, now Marco, you can. Okay, I'm I'm nervous actually. Let's see here. Oh, Marco, unmute yourself, and you should be. There we are. Oh, you're beautiful. Good to see you. How are you? I'm excellent. How are you doing, sir? Good. So you're peppering the chat with lots of comments and questions. Welcome on the show, Marco Annabelli. Please fire away. 
Um, start with uh, a premise. The, the 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 entire premise of this show, I have a I have a fundamental philosophical delta with, and that is that Bitcoin is responsible for the energy it consumes. Um, completely disagree. Bitcoin has nothing to do with the energy it consumes. It consumes energy, yes, and there's a market out there for energy. Uh, that we're all familiar with, and some of it's extremely inexpensive, solar, um, even off-gassing, although I have a problem with off-gassing, uh, because it still creates carbon dioxide. You're still burning stuff. Like Let's, let's try to get away from burning stuff altogether if we can avoid it. Um, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's a lost leader. It's a, it's a political excuse for we don't want Bitcoin here because it threatens our central bank. Right, so we're going to pick on. Oh, look! It consumes a small countries' worth of energy. Well, so does the Fed. So what? <laughs> but you know, everyone likes the U.S. dollar. Well, they used to. It seems to be a vanishingly uh, unpopular thing uh, these days. Uh, however, it consumes more energy in its infrastructural operations than Bitcoin likely ever will. Uh, but no one talks about that because we need the U.S. dollar. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is just an excuse and everyone doing their competitions for who's got more environmentally sustainable Bitcoin production is all, you know, fine and well, sure. But it really isn't a reason why Bitcoin is bad. And Elon Musk's theory was not because he didn't like the environmental impact of Bitcoin because his cars have the same environmental impact. They consume electricity. Therefore, if the electricity is dirty, it's a dirty car. Well, the, the logic doesn't flow. Right, your generation capacity and how you come about it is what it is, and you can't really sit there and say, "Well, it's not; it's your fault that you're running a mining operation in China, and therefore you're burning coal." Okay, let me pause you. Let's get response from from the panelists. Well, I mean, it's... Yeah. just go uh, after you, Andres. Okay, uh, I mean, it's a good argument for sure. I uh, get your point. I also, I think, want to add that, yeah, sure, but why not use it as an advantage? If we have an, a technology like this, why would we want to run it dirty if we can run it clean? And we want to live in a clean future. So, yeah, sure, there is an argument out there in the world that I agree with you. There's too much focus on the energy consumption of Bitcoin. But that's a different conversation for me versus should Bitcoin be clean or should Bitcoin use clean energy, which for me is a no-brainer. Because a, but why live drop in Bitcoin future? from that phrase? Drop Bitcoin from that phrase and just say, should we use clean energy? Period. Turn on our lights, charge our cell phones, run our laptops, drive our cars. All of it should be clean, not just the Bitcoin bit, right? But we seem to focus, and the press loves to do this, and politicians use this as their little excuse. But it's it's just Bitcoin. Yeah, well, I think you're kind of <laughs> seeing it the other way, man. Like, I think why I give a shit about this is that everyone in the world <laughs> for whatever reason has decided that this thing is worth something. The monkeys have assigned social value to this thing, right? Whether it's an energy input or the thermodynamic thing, I want to turn the monkeys towards clean energy, right? It's not for me. I'm not, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with Andreas. Like he's saying, Oh, if we have this thing value it, we should use clean energy. I'm actually looking around saying, how do we connect, People who will never have access to public the public good of an electrical grid because their governments or capital flight it did not ever allow you to fund it, and now we're turning around to them and saying, "Hey, you live in uh, Gambia. You live in you know some some place that will never have grid energy because it's just not going to be profitable. So we can't do it." And it's like, well, actually, we found a way to make some of these assets profitable. Let's use this hack, right? I'm kind of seeing it the other way around. Let's use Bitcoin to drive the adoption of more clean energy. Right. That's what I think is interesting. I don't really oh, that's fine. have an argument with people to be like, oh, it should, is this or that or the other? Um, who cares? I got a, I, wor I work with a fund that is using literally using Bitcoin to fund. Um, how to put this e energy generation systems that are sustainable and their awesome. actual their little change on that was they cannot be intermittent. They must be ongoing, sustainable, doesn't care whether the wind is blowing or not, doesn't care whether the sun is shining or not, it runs. And there's a lot of stuff out there that is viable and none of it is utility grade. And that's a problem. 
as you can imagine. Yep. This is yep. this is actually worse than Bitcoin. Bitcoin just attacks the monetary system. You're not talking about attacking the real monetary system, which is energy. Yeah. And I think like Andreas in his formal life, like that's now we're now we're talking trying language, man. <laughs> this is what his previous <laughs> business was, was very much going to um you know places like this that would have no chance at all of ever having profitable utility a uh, utility scale infrastructure for this stuff right mm -hmm. but now this is the thing like we might have a chance to do that and not give a shit about what some sovereign nation says is not or is or isn't profitable or what a you know multilateral organization cross-border says oh well i just wish we could fund it but you know the fdi doesn't justify it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, you know marco i th i think um you may be right that Bitcoin is unfairly targeted, right? It's using energy like Tesla's do. Um, with that said, you know, I think Bitcoin has a unique opportunity relative to many other asset classes out there that are highly fragmented in their supply chains, like say gold, for example, highly fragmented supply chain, lots of inputs like cyanide, mercury, et cetera, et cetera. Very difficult to, uh, you know, drive environmental impact or you know drive environmental sustainability of such a fragmented um you know sort of asset class um or commodity like like gold for example and so while you know folks want to defend bitcoin and say well it's just using energy uh you know i think rather than simply defend it let's drive it towards verified clean energy sources that are transparent and that's when things are going to get very interesting when this, you know, this uh, critique of Bitcoin as being a, you know, a, 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 an energy hog that's boiling the oceans. We can say, well, actually, in fact, you know, it is. That's humanity, have, not Bitcoin. Yeah, fair, <laughs> fair, fair point. Yeah. And so I think, you know, we can get Bitcoin to a place where, you know, we're actually able to account for nearly every megawatt hour that goes into this asset class. You know, line line item by line item, we know exactly what the energy source was, um, and we can actually use it to, you know, to become the most sustainable and the most transparent asset class that exists. Um, and in that process, I think there's going to be a lot of sort of additional benefits that we that we see um, in, in that process of helping Bitcoin become that ultra sustainable, ultra transparent asset class. Um, you know, I think we're going to see use cases like like Andreas. You know, we're going to see ways to drive uh, additional rec procurement, like what our protocol is going to do. You know, there's, we believe to address the existing 19.2 million Bitcoin today to address their environmental impacts, that we're going to need to procure and retire around $25 billion worth of RECs or renewable energy certificates. The entire rec market in the United States today is a $12 billion voluntary market. Why am I mentioning this? Well, I mention this because now all of a sudden Bitcoin and its sustainability has a unique opportunity to actually drive the clean energy transition in a way that I think no other asset class before it has, has had this opportunity. Um, and I think that's really the focus here for the, the panelists is, you know, getting Bitcoin to this place of truly being the most sustainable and transparent asset class and all that positive sort of, you know, additionality that can be created in that journey. Um, so that's that's my take. Don't defend, make change. Mm -hmm. Interesting. No, that's that, that's uh, cool. Mark, I mean, Mark Gordon brought up a, you brought up I something that I just wanted to quickly touch on. That was the decentralization impact of doing this. Um, the minute you get people going for uh, clean certificates on their Bitcoin production, you're disclosing the coin bases uh, of these producers uh, as clean producers. And invariably, those will be tied to IP addresses, therefore to physical locations. And you're now going to be able to track every Bitcoin produced and mm -hmm. using relatively disgusting, in my opinion, AML KYC procedures that are constantly being thrown at us left, right and center. You're going to make every single Bitcoin trackable. I mean, faster I think, than they're currently doing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the Bitcoin industry is you know, Bitcoin mining industry has gone from, you know, mom and pop, you know, or individual miners uh, to in a really industrialized sector, right? I mean, it's, it's, these are big corporations and we're increasingly seeing them become publicly traded entities. So, so what you just described, I think is happening anyway, 
Um, yeah, and I would add, man, like we already we already goofed making this a publicly legible blockchain. Period. Like, if that privacy is your problem, people can find out who you are in like three seconds if they go over to fucking one of these stupid blockchain forensic analysis companies, right? That that ship has already sailed. We fucked up the day we made this a pri publicly legible blockchain. Okay, guys, privacy. rated That's PG. First and foremost. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Well, it's okay. Anamilka, unmute yourself, <laughs> say hi, say who you are, and ask your question. But you got to unmute yourself first, or else we just look at you. See? Yep. Hi. I'm muted. Good. Hi, everyone. Most interesting discussion. I'm Anamilka, uh, normally based out of the Netherlands. Gordon and I go way back, I think. Um, yes. Interesting enough, I'm more interested looking towards the future when we go about carbon credits and carbon certificates. We recently had that big scandal at South Pole, basically discrediting one of the carbon, I would say, coverages of more, um, I would say, mainstream industry firms uh, covering their carbon tracks with buying credits from South Pole, who in hindsight seem not to be as good as anything. So. Looking towards the future, I agree with Marco, you know, nobody wants to give up their anonymity, preferably not. But I also agree with Jaid that if you want to find something, you can. I think for the industry, what we need is some sort of standard that's respected. Um, we are going to be more of a mature environment, more of a mature company-wise organized economy, if for lack of a better word. So how do we forego that? Because I can tell you this, any scandal in the crypto industry is magnified by a thousand because it is in the crypto space. Yeah. So to, to forego that, um, you know, carbon credits fly me around the ears, left, right and center. Token-based, crypto-based, God knows what else on the market. If we don't want to end up somewhere in a region where we give other people, I would say, reason to discredit crypto, cri cri cryptocurrencies as a general, we should come up with some sort of solution for that. Because Tesla was just named recently. Most of the money Tesla made by selling its carbon credits, not by making profits on these cars. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the world it's the world upside down, basically. My country is currently at a complete holdup due to all sorts of situations with emissions and Brussels and God knows what else. So it's in the highlight of being credible. All these discussions go about the same thing in general, and that is how credible is what you state about what you do. And I think we should look for a solution for that in the industry. And I already named in my question such a general standard, but who, who made that standard? Perhaps Bradford has a much better answer to that than I have. Uh, who standard? You know, if you look at the United Nations climate change, or for fun, I just ticked it in on my computer. Yeah, and, and then what? It says United Nations Carbon Offset Platform, hallelujah. And in the middle of that, South America sells carbon credits left, right, and center on top of, I would say, areas that are not suited to sell carbon credits on at all. So we, we need some sort of respectability in this area, guys. Otherwise, we just end Whoa. up in another... I think this, uh, you know, your original question of you and the blockchain token-based carbon credits after the discovery yeah. of South Pole's, you know, and chicanery, um, this is exactly the area that we're investing as a fund. So basically, you know, we, we need three things, essentially. Like you, we're at a point where, you know, from our point of view, you need to be able to tokenize some of these assets so that you can actually monitor them and you can have digital uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification that's trustless and permissionless. We've, you know, 14 years into this trustless database, um, decentralized database sort of revolution, if you want to call it that. I don't really, it's hard for me not to roll my eyes when people say that, but like, uh, yeah, it's just me. Um, Cause like at the end of the day, there's very few people who are actually on this for that revolution. Like, and they're not actually acting in that way, but different conversation. Um, the you need to have some way like i have a friend here in barcelona actually he's a, he runs a fund as well node capital he is very much focused he's a max he's a decentralization maxi so when i bring him projects like region network or toucan protocol or any of these other folks who are focused on building uh, trackable open accounting systems for carbon right uh -huh. his question is always how do they measure this in a way where it can't be messed with <laughs> right like that's exactly like my point and, and so like that, I think it, we're 
we're at a point where we can begin to do that stuff depending on the methodology, right? The simpler it is, the more physical, the more close it is to physics, the better we can do it. So uh, to give you an example, direct air capture technologies even now have their problems because you know, micro, there's this thing, there's a advanced market commitment in AMC from Microsoft, Stripe, Facebook, and a number of other gigantic purchasers. Mm -hmm. They've committed to purchasing a billion dollars of direct air capture carbon credits uh, uh, over the next, I think, 10 years. And it's actually not that much at the end of the day when you think about it. But regardless of that, you actually, you know, the first question that comes up with Microsoft, because Microsoft is super sophisticated on this. They have like a thousand employees in their sustainability and climate division. They have been working on this for over a decade. And when you ask them, oh, great. Yeah, we made this commitment. So uh, can you, how can you prove to me that you capture the carbon? <laughs> We're back at square one, right? So yeah. like now there are companies now who are looking at that from the very first perspective and saying, what was the physics into and out of the vessel that captures the carbon, right? Can we actually show what entered it and what exited it on a mass basis and then actually show how much carbon was pulled out of the air, right? Now, can we make that publicly auditable, right? Can we put that, or, or does anyone in the audience or here on the panel know of any publicly auditable technologies that might use for this? I don't know. I'm kind of- They're, you know, they're in, they're in development, you. actually. We, we've <laughs> right, got- <Mike. laughs> <laughs> I, no, we I'm do, kind we of do. joking, being facetious, but yes, like the point we could be pulling blockchains into this, right? And so, like, the there are a number of you know that's number one, right? Is just do we we need open accounting systems? Then we need markets with the data that can actually transact on this stuff, and you need a way to actually raise capital for those markets. And so, when I look at your question again with this, like, we need a mechanism that says, "Hey, South Pole said they did a monoculture uh, have, have project you got, on this tract of land." You... Have you gotten the details about what went on out there? I, I was just oh, absolutely. I, I, I was, know I know quite a bit about it. <laughs> I was just I was just like, hallelujah! Is nobody paying yeah. any attention to this? Yeah, what yeah. are these? You know, you so that means that all the carbon say, credits, yeah, all the carbon credits to... that these companies bought is just window dressing. They don't. Well, just... to be let's get very specific here. It's not even that the carbon credits are window dressing. Is what the question is? What does a carbon credit represent? Right. And what it represents based on its methodology and its maturity year is an amount of carbon sucked up by something by a particular year. So you should be able to say, if I'm buying this credit, is the carbon that it represents in the air still or is it stuck in something right. like soil or trees? Or so to, to get right. sorry to interrupt you, Jade. Do you think that maybe the solution is that we have different classes in these Oh, of course carbon, carbon as absolutely has I anybody say, come up have any, has anybody come up with some sort of i mean we know the general asset classes you know in the traditional stock trade and such have we got anything like that for carbon credits yet not quite yeah we just divided them up by methodologies and codes for the methodologies what have you but like this is kind of what we were building as a fund is we want to be able to be basically at a very low level say if you're buying from a curated pool of carbon projects, you need to understand what is the maturity year and the methodology that populated credits into that pool if you're a purchaser, so that you can simply understand how was the carbon pulled into the thing it was pulled into, whether it was a vessel in direct air capture or it was soil carbon sequestration or a grasslands project or an ocean project. And then you need to understand uh, how much of that carbon has been calculated to be captured. And then you need to know if it's nature-based solutions, uh is the tree are the trees still there and that's actually a very simple exactly. measurement actually exactly. like exactly. and it goes down to stuff like land provenance land ownership and land title coupled with remote monitoring right now the other thing to understand is that and why people should be annoyed at south pole is that they found ways to basically hijack these projects from the view i'm not gonna actually <laughs> these are not my words i'm actually quoting someone else you could check out their youtube channel but basically i'm not making any more bold claims than that what i'm saying is if you look at the numbers what they've been able to do is ship 40 million you know, i'll look at the i'll look at the vera project for this but there's a vera project they did they got a lot of scrutiny for in zimbabwe where they basically shipped something like 30 to 40 million credits and the the co-benefits of those credits so for 40 30 to 40 million we're talking about almost half a billion in revenue here right I know, over, I know. over 10 to 15 years yeah. and what you're seeing after that is roughly the co-benefits which are payments to people ecosystem service pay, services payments to people who manage the land ended up being something like one hundred ten thousand dollars, right for that total amount which is just 
you know, kind of a joke. <laughs> because the, you, the, actually, like, the, buy, the buyback and sale that they did on some of these things where they sort of pocketed the profits in counter uh, reaction to actual the contract. I mean, it's a, it's a really, how do you say that? It will be very hard to do something about it, but it's it doesn't help matters. Let me put it that way. Yes. So going going back to crypto, um, if we have a simple asset class distinction, like let's say five origins of having a carbon, I wouldn't say neutral, let's say carbon positive situation. How do you see that working in the market space? Because a Bitcoin, like one of the earlier speakers already said, a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. I mean, it doesn't have a sticker on it. Let's let's say I'm 50% green or something. How how are we going to to see that? As, we, because, we, we we can't. We we, we no, can't because exactly. carbon That's... carbon is not fungible. Carbon is de carbon depends on how you capture it. If you look at yeah. the yield curve of a tree capturing carbon versus a biochar project versus um, uh, an enhanced rock weathering project, the yield curves are completely different. So, like you have, if you have a forest project, carbon basically looks like an S curve. It looks like this over time. A biochar project is linear. An enhanced rock weathering project can actually look something like a, an exponential curve. So, mm -hmm. the straight up, they're not they're not fungible assets, right? In my opinion, okay. but they're being treated. So, the market treats them as fungible. So then you have two sides. You have either. I would say the permission status of the authorities of having Bitcoin mining on the premises in some way or another, where they would admire or at least be happy that it's energy positive, let me put it that way. But for the market and the consumer, he can't make any distinction. A Bitcoin is just a Bitcoin. So the advantage is going to be that you're going to be allowed to have Bitcoin mining maybe in areas where you couldn't have it before because you were very negative on the energy side. Is that a correct assumption? Maybe, but I think the more important thing is a kilowatt hour is a kilowatt hour, <laughs> right? And then I, being I, able to I look at that. it. I, yeah. I know that. And then but I think the... going at the source of the kilowatt hour then becomes like the more interesting question for the miners upstream. I don't know, maybe I'm answering yeah. your question, Bradford. Let me, let me pause you guys for a second. It. So we, we had two people who asked interesting questions in the chat. If they're available to ask the question to a group, that'd be great. Uh, Monty and Camille. Monty, can you speak? Can you? Are you there? Yeah, I am. Can you? Uh, your 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 yeah. voice is cutting in and out a little bit. Give it give it a try. Can my audio. People? Monty, sorry, it's very scratchy. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I'm writing the piece for Coin Telegraph and probably will be re Can you hear me? Not really. I, I'm enjoy one more try. Uh, try. Try again. Gordon, why don't you ask me the question? Ask, ask the panel the question. Um. You know, okay. Hold on here. Do me a favor, resend it to me in the in the Q and A, and then I'll re ask it if you don't mind. Sorry, uh, Camille, if you're there and you can hear us, feel free. Yeah, I yeah, think it was. Thank, you. Hey, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, I was just wondering if uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, data already available or log on the different sources of energy which are used for the Bitcoin production even if it's not there. But since we are talking about sustainability, so ultimately, uh, according to my uh, you know, vision, ultimately everything has to be converted into uh, the, uh, some kind of a renewable energy source. So uh, does it make any sense to have this kind of log so that uh, everybody knows and it's a transparent system so that, uh, you know, however the bitcoins are being produced so that uh, people should be aware you know this was the source of energy uh, through which the bitcoin was uh, produced uh, so ultimately what will be the vision so this is my question i think your first question was what is the current bitcoin energy mix right and i think uh, you should look you should google daniel batten or go on Twitter. He recently published a really good analysis of this that showed something like 52.4% of Bitcoin's energy use comes from renewables um, wow. or green energy. And then um, there's a Cambridge study as well that he critiqued that had the number landing somewhere around 40%. So you should look at both of those and decide, you know, make your own sort of 
um, you know, assumptions and then evaluate the claims being made. Interesting. And I think, sorry, sorry. Let, let me jump in. So I think Monty's question is, is there a danger that governments in a bid to meet net zero commitments will seek to ban Bitcoin? No, uh, I'll come and take it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Come and take it. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we've already seen a, a great sort of example of this where China in uh, around July 2021, they banned Bitcoin mining when approximately 50 plus percent of, percent of all Bitcoin mining was taking place in China, about, you know, 50, 55 percent of hash rate was in mainland. Um, we saw a quick dip in hash rate. Uh, and then we saw uh, the, that, you know, those ASICs rigs, the computers that mine Bitcoin, uh, we saw them shipped around the world uh, and installed elsewhere in the world. And we saw the, the hash rate or the network security, if you will, uh, increase back to pre-China ban levels. Um, so to answer your question more directly, uh, there's very little risk. If the United States bans Bitcoin mining, Iran is going to embrace it. Brazil will embrace it. There's zero chance that it's going to be banned everywhere in the world. We've never seen anything banned everywhere in the world. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is, you know, it, it's, it's coordination across every government has never occurred. Um, yeah, and it's never going like, to. Well, like, let's, sorry, let's, 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 really mean? let's be well, clear. Let, China is still mining Bitcoin. It's just the government's doing it now, not the private sector. Okay, but well, I, I, Iran, I, 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 in Iran is the same. Guys, 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 hold, hold on, hold on one second. Uh, but I, I love the energy. Is, is there a danger that it will be banned enough that it will be a problem? And let me—that's to the no. panelists. No. Okay, well that's easy. No. 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 Well, why? Why, no. why do you say no? There's going to be oh. countries that 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 will embrace it no matter what. When I think you know, that when, if you have a worldwide ban. The question is not about the ban or even the coordination of it. It's enforcement. <laughs> like, how would, what are the vectors? What is the threat vector? And how would you actually enforce it? That's the meaningful question, right? And okay. Well, you, you do know the already... recent precedent that the US government actually owns all activity on the internet and you're under US jurisdiction if you use the internet. Yeah. <laughs> please, please come and enforce it <laughs> right? again, right? Like, that's the only ultimate uh. question that matters, right? The, all of the all the stuff are like, oh, what if they do this, what if they do that? How are they going to enforce it, right? And and the people who actually have the demand for the service that Bitcoin provides, almost all of it, most of us on this chat are in this channel aren't even the primary customers of it, right? It's people in places like Cuba, Iran, Venezuela, and all these other really amazingly well proven use cases that Bitcoin serves, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you're one of those Bitcoin pizza daily people, like who I respect actually, but there's a couple in Barcelona. They only do, they only pay for everything in Bitcoin. They only transact in Bitcoin. Um, then at ten thousand Bitcoin have, per pizza. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And these, well, of course not. But you know, but these people are. No, it's ten thousand uh, pizzas per Bitcoin. There you now, go. Right? Now, but now, like, now, finally. But the thing, my point with this being that like there is an obvious use case that it fits and if that demand for it exists there will be a way for it to surface as there always has been for these things you know i pointed at stuff like sex work drugs everything else right that's we will find a way to fulfill that even if the wor worldwide coordination somehow gets to a point where that happens good luck but if it does how will you enforce it yeah, Gordon, you little. must remember the you must remember the 90s when they had the whole kerfuffle in the us about exporting encryption technology and the, the, yeah, the slogan yeah, that went it, around the private condition. community was, yeah, well, the, the slogan going around the uh, cypherpunk world in the 90s was, if you outlaw good encryption, then only outlaws will have good encryption. So go ahead yeah. and outlaw Bitcoin, but then only outlaws will have Bitcoin. <laughs> Got it. So let me let me come to Rashid. You, you, ta you asked a question in the chat. If you're able to unmute yourself and just go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, hey, Rashid. Actually, uh, uh, together with the, with the partners, uh, we uh, possess uh, a concession of uh, natural hydrogen uh, in Africa. And uh, I believe you know that uh, natural or, or hydrogen in general uh, has a great potential for the future. So I, I'm wondering whether such asset can be uh, tokenized. Panel? Well, just give me, just give me a call. Yeah, Rashid, okay. give Anna Milka a call, but let's actually answer the question. <laughs> yes, 
you know, any, anything can be tokenized, but it depends on what you want to do with the token that's important. You know, is it means of investment? Is it means, you know, like an asset class, like, like shares? Or is it meant as, as payment? Is it um, meant to be transferred in smaller quantities? Can you break it up in, in quantities, you know, that are the size of buying a loaf of bread? Um, it's, it's very important to decide what you want to do with, with, with a token on a concession of, of hydrogen. Anything can be tokenized. Well, yeah, thank you. Well, mainly so, we, want to use, we want to use the money, you know, uh, uh, for, for the production uh, 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 of, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to proceed with the exploration as well as, uh, as the production. So this is mainly we want to use uh, the money for. So that's mainly a, a token to to make money, of, I would say, uh, funds available to develop the hydrogen plant. Is that it? That's correct. But, yeah. Well, that depends on the project plan. It's basically like with any other project plan that you go through the front door of a bank with, um, you have to present it in the correct way and it has to be followed up. Um, if you've got such a plan available, uh, you, you know, you, you're ready to sort of have somebody look at it and get it criticized, basically. And if you have not, that plan should be made. It's basically a development plan like any other. Yeah. Rashid, okay. basically Fine. get Mana, Anamilka's name, write it down, you'll get, her on, <laughs> you'll get her on LinkedIn, send her your plan, and you'll be a billionaire tomorrow. I don't expect that to be, but to be, to be serious, guys, um, remember 2017 where the legs were hanging out of the buildings for people making kinds of plans like this? The mm. world's changed. We're five years down the line. Uh, it's like any business plan should contain uh, the decent information that due diligence is possible. Otherwise, you, you will not get any serious investor to doing anything in it. You, you right, know guys. that what... what uh, what's, what's, sorry, what, what, one second. Just so you guys know, we're, we're over time. We lost two of our panels because we went over. So, Rashida, I'm giving you the last comment. Make it brief. Okay. I'm not kicking you off. I'll just make it brief and then we're going to wrap it. So, Rashid, go. Okay. No, it's, a, it's a just we were, you know, digging a well uh, for, for water. Um, and within uh, uh, 70 meter uh, deep, uh, we got the hydrogen. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, it's very rich in hydrogen and also it has natural gas as well. So, but well, we, we, it's very, we, it's we, very we easy. You, you take my first name, you put the little monkey tails, and then you add blockbeauty.nl, and I'll answer you to the best of my ability. Blockbeauty.nl. Okay, fine, <laughs> guys, we're, we're, we're good. I, I okay. can't help it. <laughs> I, 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 fantastic. Okay, everyone, thank you for joining Crypto Wednesdays number 32. Anastasia, thank you so much uh, for co hosting. Andreas, you know, thanks for sticking out. You, you made it. Uh, thanks to, to, to Heath and um, Bradford. Thank you. I see, you know, Sunil is kicking in. Uh, Marco, thank you. always thank you. Monty, everyone, Namilka. Anytime. Thank you. You're a good thank man. You. I'm stopping the recording. See you next thanks, week. Guys.